three months gives you the opportunity to make friends on the ground, to build a new life in a place, and really get a sense for what your identity is in a new city. Whereas if you're somewhere in the middle, like a month and a half, it's not long enough to make friends or build any kinds of roots or really dig in and create a local identity for yourself. You're just really a tourist who's run out of all the tourist stuff to do. Hey, podcast listener, even if you are alone in your entrepreneurial journey, know that today, right now in your earbuds, you are joined by thousands of entrepreneurs from all around the globe seeking to grow better, more profitable, location-independent businesses. If you'd like to learn more about what we do and download our entire back catalog, check out tropicalmba.com. All right, welcome back. Today, we are joined by my friend, Noah Kagan, for a game of Would You Rather. In fact, today's episode is the second annual episode with Noah Kagan at the end of our Barcelona summer together. If you don't know Noah, he's got an incredibly broad range of business experience and success. Currently, is the CEO at AppSumo, the best place to find software deals on the web. They have over 100 employees and a whole lot of revenue. You can Google it. Formerly, he was at Facebook and Mint on the side. He does a YouTube channel with nearly 1 million subscribers. He also does an excellent podcast called Noah Kagan Presents. Today, we posed to him a variety of questions like, would you rather give equity to your employees or your advisors? Where would you rather start a million-dollar business? Would you rather rent or own your primary residence? Would you rather buy a, quote, boring business with your investment cash or buy a tech-enabled dynamic business? That and a lot more on today's pod. One quick thing here at the top. After last week's episode, I received over 20 long-form email messages, also some on the Twitter DMs from you guys. One of the strongest responses in a while I've received from a podcast episode. I appreciate your support and ideas, feedback and critiques. If I keep getting this kind of feedback, there's going to have to be two episodes a week. There's just so much coming through the inbox. Cam writes to say, but the trouble with endurance sports is that most people who do it neglect strength, training, and mobility. And so he said, by the time I did that and it got into my 40s, I'd wrecked my flexibility and mobility. My hand is slowly going up in the air, Cam. It's really hard when you're getting good at an endurance sport to tire yourself out building things like muscle when you know you could get faster at your sport. That's definitely a conflict that I feel. Cam goes on to write, Later in life, it's important to think about which sports to compete in, but probably to continue to do more than one sport to keep everything in balance. So covering things like aerobic fitness, mobility, strength, bone density, and things like yoga and meditation to keep your mental clarity and mental strength. Cam, thank you for writing. I know that you are correct. I'm having trouble implementing your advice. So I'm, I, know, I know that Cam is right. I don't like it, but I know he's right. Darren writes to say, I picked up salsa dancing. It's less punishing on my joints, super social, and it's a fun lifetime skill that I can use anywhere in the world. I haven't found anything as thrilling as competitive basketball, though, but it's a decent second. Darren also shared with me a brilliant piece that he wrote about the emotional transition from being an elite athlete in both basketball and tennis and having to take a step back from that because of an injury. Uh, we'll link up to that in the show notes. Thank you again for your emails about the pod. Another topic coming up before we jump into the interview. How long should summer vacations be? I've been here in Europe for over two months. But recently, I heard a listener say that you should polarize your vacations. That should never get stuck in the middle. If you want to go somewhere, you should go somewhere for three months plus or for a week. I thought, what's the dominant thinking? in the podcast audience about how long you should go places. The reason is, is this somewhat resonated with me. I really like the idea of polarization. Three months gives you the opportunity to make friends on the ground, to build a new life in a place, and really get a sense for what your identity is in a new city. Whereas if you're somewhere in the middle, like a month and a half, it's not long enough to make friends or build any kinds of roots or really dig in and create a local identity for yourself. You're just really a tourist who's run out of all the tourist stuff to do. So why not just put down the telephone, put down the laptop, and really enjoy yourself in a new place 
do the tourist thing. I think doing that less than a week, couple days, that's the way to go. So really cool advice and framework on the polarization thing, although it doesn't work for everything. Like recently, my partner and I went to Thailand and we were there for 10 days and it was like, hey, that's not enough. We flew the whole way to Thailand, did some research online about it. Turns out a lot of people have these frameworks where it's like, it depends how long it takes you to get there. And that makes a lot of sense. Like if you're going to fly for a 30 hour itinerary, maybe two weeks, maybe three weeks, two to three weeks makes a lot of sense because you've invested so much to get there. But if you've flown across the pond to come to good old Europe, for example, maybe seven to 10 days is a little bit more appropriate. And then of course, you've got your weekenders, which you can do all throughout the year with relative low investment and low stress. I like to stick personally to this idea of being polarized as a location independent nomad who tends to move around quite a bit, but I make exceptions if I got personnel or a plan. And so here in Barcelona, I've both got friends that have been with me all summer. We're hanging out, throwing paper airplanes in the office. We've also got a plan. We're riding our bikes multiple times a week, organizing get togethers, doing weekend trips, and generally just having an awesome, big chill summer. So if you got personnel or a plan, I think you can go away from the polarized strategy. But I do think in general, this idea that three months plus or keeping things on the shorter end make a lot of sense. I'd love to hear what you think. Have you ever gone someplace as a nomad or just relocating for a while for like a month and a half and been like, I wish this would have been 10 days or two weeks. All right, that's it at the top. If you want to hear some news, I'll come back at the end of the interview to share some things I've been up to this week. But right now, I'm super excited to introduce you to my good friend, my office mate, and now second annual Tropical MBA guest here for a game of Would You Rather, Noah Kagan. Can I not? Can I not do Ian jokes? You can do Ian jokes. Hey, what's up, guys? It's Ian Schoen. Yeah, so I was working on my Miata. Well, let me tell you, that's a real American car. Go ahead and do your impression. <laughs> Go ahead. You can put it on wax. So, yeah, I was working in my shop, and I was really reflecting on being a parent and uh -huh. a father and just like that nomadic lifestyle that I used to live in, just really how we're evolving. And, you know, really what it all comes down to is a good deal. <laughs> <laughs> so right, do like, another one. I'm, I'm, this is, uh, you know... <laughs> <laughs> Let me just talk to you guys about, so, you know, everyone knows I'm from West Virginia, born and raised. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I live in Austin now on a ranch, but, and it was a good deal. You know, that's, we come back to it. It's a good <laughs> it's deal. A good deal. <laughs> <laughs> I love my business partner, Dan. That's, that's probably the first thing. Like in my life, there's Dan, my family, and then the DC. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's what we're going to do, Noah, Noah Kagan, everybody. Noah Kagan from AppSumo.com, the best place on the web to get software deals, has dropped by the podcast. Here's what's going to happen, Noah Kagan. We're going to play a little game of Would You Rather. I know it's a game yeah. that you're familiar with the general guidelines. Now, it might be the case that you are unimpressed with my Would You Rather setups at the beginning. Don't fret. Stick with me here. Dig in. We will arrive at some interesting conversations. You ready to get it kicked off? Oh, yeah. Okay. Would you rather only read books or only listen to podcasts for the next 12 months? Books. Why? I think of it as like time allocation. I'm generally more in areas where I'm reading. So I'm either in bed, which is I do a lot of reading, or I'm at my kitchen table. And podcast listening or audiobooks is more just commuting. So the amount of time is actually less. I think there's this concept of CEOs or readers. Yeah, what is it? And Leader, I see you with leaders the, or readers? Leaders or readers. I see you with the book in your hand all the time. Mm -hmm. Is that directed to make you a better person? Is it your entertainment? Yeah, so would, the would you rather is interesting too because I do think there's also a big discrepancy between podcast learning and audiobook learning. Okay. I think like podcast learning is inspiration and then audiobooks are kind of like denser information. You might actually learn something. Like you're trying to learn an actual thing where podcasts for me are like, Dan and Ian said this, which then sparked this, which then led me to that. Yeah. But then an, an audio book, it's like I'm listening to Greg LeMond's The Comeback, which is so phenomenal. It is. It's so phenomenal. It's a great story. I'm not necessarily learning anything, but it's just like an entertaining story. I wonder if that's an opportunity for podcasters. 
Because like you see some shows now coming with this audiobook density. Yes. Huberman's an example of that. Mm. Founders is an example Founders of that. Founders is fire, dude. And I've always had this idea of how much time are you folding into one, say, 30-minute podcast? What Gimlet essentially did was showed up to the scene in, what was it, 2014? Mm. And they were like, instead of spending 10 hours on 30 minutes, we're going to spend 80 hours on 30 minutes. Cool. And they built, I don't know how many millions of dollars of a startup off of that one simple observation that they were going to fold more time into the podcast. And I wonder if there's an opportunity, like seeing the Huberman podcast kind of blow up in the past couple of years, what I see there is an operator who understands the median and understands they need somebody with the experience and track record, but they can facilitate them to bring that to market in terms of really well executed episodes. I was even thinking last night, and I was like, man, I want more denser information of things I want to learn. And I was like, is it even out there? Right? Like in business, like operation management of companies that are around 100 people, which is give or take where we're at. Or how do you go from 50, 100 million to beyond? Like, where's that information? Where like, do you learn how to run a 100 person company right now? It's like, from coaches, right? Is that Twitter and TikTok? <laughs> <laughs> I buy these guru courses, really. And uh, I'm going to cut this off. Get back to our lowbrow game of would you rather... Would you rather give <laughs> equity to your employees or your advisors? Oh, man. I'm going to say neither. Do I have to choose? No. It's your show. Because I, 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 I don't mean to be the... the I, hate when that I guy. don't know why this question occurred to me, but it occurred to me before this conversation, and now you're talking about advisors. Yeah, we've done both. I've done both. I've given equity to very early advisors who gave me some advice and then kind of checked out, and they are on our cap table. They own... Part of the business. You, are you public about how much of AppSumo you own? Yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I'm almost about 60%. Okay. And then Chad... So there's my, 40% that we're talking about right now. No, Chad, my business partner, owns the other majority. Okay. Chad Boyda, who is the CTO? CTO, and yeah, he joined about nine months after I started. Okay. And has been with me ever since. We've been together. Not He's been with me. I've been with him. <laughs> and um, we own the majority. And there's about 10 or 15% outside of that. Got it. And so... We gave these people and it's great because it was cool and they have fancy names and most people know them and I appreciated it. But like once you give it, it never comes back. And I've tried to buy it off them and they're like, well, and they're also most of these people are sophisticated. So they're like, what's your valuation? Oh, I want a multiple of that. And they're like, oh, it's forever. And then on the teammate side, I think equity matters if you plan on either distributions and dividend or some type of liquidity. If you are not doing that, you're really misleading your team. And that's something we've done back and forth, if I'm honest. Yeah. And it's not because we're trying to be deceitful. There's like norms, right? Employees show up and they ask for that stuff. It depends on the types of teammates or if you can call them employees in general. At Epson, we do like calling them teammates, but it depends on the employee. Sophisticated Silicon Valley people, minimum, what's my trigger? What's the vesting schedule? What's the cap table look like? Are we looking at more rounds? What's my dilution going to be? There's a lot of these questions that they'll know. And then a lot of other people, maybe internationally, potentially, which is not as normal, or people in America that are more not into Silicon Valley or that experience, don't ask about it. But the reality is, is like, what type of talent are you trying to recruit? So if you're trying to recruit people that worked at Uber and worked at Google or any of these companies, that is the, that's how much comp they're going to expect. It's a compensation amount, ultimately. And so we do have to pay top market. I'm at a point right now, I don't want to be giving out equity because I don't have a liquidation thing I'm going to be doing. We don't really do dividends that way. We normally do profit sharing or, or bonuses. So it's kind of doing a disservice to be like, let's give you equity and then it's not going to be worth anything. It's just fake money. So at 37 Signals, if we can put in the show notes, they have a great article about how they give give out. Uh, it's just bonuses and profit share as a yeah. part of, and then him and J Jason and David just own the business though. Makes sense. Would you rather start your million dollar weekend business in Texas or California? Yeah, California. California. Yeah. Go on. It depends on what time. There's a lot of different factors, like what time of life am I in? Like, sure. Am I 20 or am I 40? What's the first thing that came into your mind when I asked? We hired this company called Reboot.io as a CEO and leadership coaches. So they advise me and we do coaching with a few other people on the team. He always asks this question, which I love. He says, what are you optimizing for? What are you optimizing for? And so the one thing I was optimizing for is where is there a larger amount of people who are millionaires? Where? California. And if I'm trying to do a million dollar weekend, I'd rather be around richer people. Only, and that's not to say that you couldn't make a million dollar business anywhere because you can. 
But I think if I wanted to make a million dollar business and it has to be in 48 hours, which is crazy, I'm like, well, where's the people who have a lot of money? My expertise is in marketing, YouTube, things of that nature. I could probably more likely find companies and individuals that have capital that they could spend on me more so than in Texas. Love it. Would you rather invest in a first time founder who had a credible plan to make $1 million or a credible plan to make $1,000? <laughs> I'd rather invest in someone who's already made the money. I think that's where I look at. I only invest in products. When I do angel invest, I've done maybe 10. Only invest in, I only invest in products I use. Like I have to have used or your product or really, really know you super well. But almost it's exclusively products I've used. So I don't generally invest in plans. What if you had to bet on a founder? I don't know if the money alone is the only measurement, but... Pro you only knew two pieces of information yeah, about Yeah, that, that one wants to do a thousand, one wants to do a million. Maybe the thousand. I think it's more realistic. The argument, counter argument's like, well, a million, they have bigger dreams, bigger visions, but it's also, it's like further away and most people never start. I was teasing the team about this yesterday because we're, we're doing 2024 budgeting. I'm like, yeah, just change the number on the spreadsheet. We'll just do it. Whatever, change the number. It's like, yeah, it's spreadsheet math. It's spreadsheet business. But the reality of getting a dollar and getting a customer and keeping them happy and making sure you have profit is much harder than changing a spreadsheet number. And so I think if you can get the confidence and get something at a thousand, there's more likelihood you can evolve it and get it to a beyond. It's a bit of an alley-oop because sometimes I think of you as the think small guy. Wow. What makes you think of that? Well, let me put it this way. You encourage people to get momentum and start right now. It's like you're the Dave Ramsey debt snowball guy. He's like, if you put it up on a slide deck and you know you had your spreadsheets and stuff, sure, it makes sense to like pay off this loan first. But something about the million dollar weekend strategy, your kind of philosophy for business taps into this idea. It's actually really important to put money in the bank account right now. It's all about momentum. Everything in business is momentum. It's like get going. Like the detriment of business is when you're sidelining, when you're thinking about it, you're like, oh, I got a plan. No one cares about your plan. Your customers care about their problems in their life. <laughs> and so I think the idea that no you can... No one cares about your plan. I love it. Right? <laughs> customers care about their problems. They don't care about your opportunity. They don't care about your market size. They care about their complaining husband. And they care about their kids who want to go to a good school. Or maybe they don't want to go to school and they want a vacation. And so I am betting on people who take action and follow through. Like I'm always amazed at people that just stick with things. That's who I would bet on. Like anybody who does that and ideally with a good attitude. Like I've seen it. There's this guy, he bought the million dollar weekend pre-order he's on our launch team and he's just hustling I don't he's not it's maybe not working exactly the way he wants it necessarily but at least he's like he's out on the court shooting and eventually he's going to get better and better and better he's going to get to the business that he can then start scaling and beyond hey if you like the show just want to remind you we have a website tropicalmba.com and click through on your phone check us out on the web hit that subscribe button I write the newsletter every week. There's a lot going on behind the scenes of the pod. And that's the best way to find out about upcoming events, both virtual, in-person, and much more. Check us out at tropicalmba.com and give us some feedback on this brand spanking new website. Because it's time for a spanking. Would you rather traditionally publish or self-publish? Depends on your goal. I'll tell you, I'm, I'm traditionally publishing right now. So it depends on your goal. If you're wanting to be a consultant or a thought leader or an influencer, traditionally publishing helps because if you have, I'm a bestseller, which for some reason, bestseller is like the new 30 under 30 from Forbes. Like everyone's yeah. a bestseller now. Like All, you could be a bestseller in a category of seven books. And, yeah. It's like no one's a medium seller or like an average seller. <laughs> Solid, consistent seller. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think there's different strategies. Let me reframe the question. I think it'll put it in... A, in if someone told you they went to Harvard, what do you think? What's your first thought? They're smart. There is something there when you're published with, like I'm published with Penguin, which is the number one thing and number one publisher and I'll be in you know, some bookstores and all these things. You're still like, man, it's Harvard. It's MIT. Oh, but college sucks. But there's still like an association there. Yeah. More so than if you're in a self-published book. And self-published books like name any, let's just even take five years because self-published has been popular, not just recent for years though. Is there any book in the top five in your in your mind that you're like, oh man, I bought this ebook, I bought this Kindle Direct published book <laughs> that just like it's that just crushed? Yeah, yeah, that was self published, and I can't really think of many. There's some like cult books, like the one I revisited recently was 
exploitative play in live poker by Alex Fitzgerald. It's so good. It's yeah, like there's... it's one of the best books written about poker of all time. And it's kind of got this mystique because it's it's hard to get your hands on. Totally. But. I mean, and there's trade-offs. Like I've been, so I'm, I've done two of my own little self-publishing books that I don't even know if they made like, maybe they made a few hundred bucks, maybe a thousand bucks. And I would say the the traditional publishing takes longer. To get to the book, it took me three years for proposal, one year, writing the book two years, and now it's about a year to, to get ready to launch it. Wow. And then, so it, it takes time. There's a lot more like scrutiny. Like I want to include a QR code in the book. And they're like, oh, we, legal doesn't know if they want to do that. At the end of the day, it's fine, but there, and there's some, there's a lot of benefits. Like, you know, they have access to shows when you're more traditional, like not access, but they can probably more likely get you on CNBC, like YouTube channel, which is a yeah. pretty big YouTube channel. Doesn't mean I, I could probably get that potentially without it. I'm happy with traditional publishing. I just don't know if I'd want to do another book. The other it's day. a lot. But, you're in the middle of it. Um, yeah, I'm on, I got maybe about five months for launch, but I'm glad. I think with, when you work on an internet business, everything is quick and I wanted something slow. I wanted something that's going to take two to three years. And I was like, okay, cool. Because so much of our businesses, that, especially the listeners and, and Sumo and yours, and it's like, okay, we have a three-month quarter. What's our plan? Yeah. Or one-month plan. Yeah. So I was like, okay, what's my like three-year, four-year plan? Because I'm not, I don't generally think that way. I'm generally thinking about one-year timeframes. Speaking of one year, would you rather in one year be stopped more or less by fans of your YouTube channel? More. What does it feel like? What does it look like when you're walking down the street? It happens quite a bit. I was in therapy yesterday. Shout out Larry. <laughs> and I was talking about how I was jealous of someone. And um, that's very big of you. He's like, oh, what are you jealous of? I'm like, well, he's got more attention than me. And he's like, well, if you had more attention, what does that do for you? I was like, I don't know. Maybe I'd feel more uh, validated. He's like, well, how come you're not validated right now? Like, what's missing from right now? And it's like, I was like, nothing. <laughs> I'm like... <laughs> Well, and it was this, you know, when people talk about the treadmill of wanting more and more and more and more and more and when is it enough? And I think what Larry says is, how do I give myself more of the acknowledgement where I don't need the external validation? I don't need views or tweeting about how much money this person has or their exit or what they did with their business. And I'm just more proud of the work I'm doing myself, separate of independent to some extent of the external validation. And so his comment and what we explored was just like acknowledging like my book. I spent three years and with Tall Roz, we finished it and it's a great book. I'm so proud of it. I think it'll help people who want to get businesses going fast and want to overcome the fears of asking and starting. And so... But back to the validation Yeah, part. and so back to the validation with all this stuff, I'm just proud of it. And I don't need a million people telling me it's great or not. I'm, I'm proud of it myself. And so working more on that. So on the separate part of that, when I am out, it is exciting because I know for me, when I see someone that I'm like, oh, shit, like that's cool. You've impacted me. And a lot of times I don't believe them. They're like, oh, I love your son. I'm like, you sure you have the right person? Is another, you know, Jewish bald person that you like? <laughs> and, um, but no, I feel honored and I feel excited that I, I do my best to acknowledge them. And they're like, oh, I've seen that. And I really, I'm like, tell me about you. And it's cool. Like, I think it makes, helps me in connecting with people on this planet. And being public in general has been such a benefit. Just meeting people, learning from people, connecting with people, experiences with people. So I think I'm, I could, I don't know if I could use a little more. I'm at a great point of notoriety where it's not so much like think about being Drake. I've actually thought about this. So Drake can't literally go outside. I wouldn't notice. I have no idea what he looks like, actually. I would notice Dale Earnhardt Jr., but not Drake. Yeah. So anyways, but Drake going outside can't go outside. He yeah. literally can't go outside. And that's just like you can't live. But yeah, I like the fact that I can impact people and connect with them and get to talk with them for a brief period of time. It's special. Would you rather rent or own your primary residence? Own. Why? Because landlord Shlomo can never kick me out. And I bought my house, this house, and I, I just love it. I love my house. And I, th I think for your primary residence, sometimes I think of it as expensive storage unit. <laughs> it's like, you know, storage unit's 300 bucks a month. Your house is like, you know, thousands a month in a... Uh, but if there's an area that you th can see yourself living in for an extended period of time, your rent won't change. The house can be any way you want. You can have a lot more control over those things. Let's just take the counter example. If I was renting at the house I'm in now and they're like, actually, we want you to leave in six months. I'm like, I love You'd this You'd be house. heartbroken, yeah. Yeah, I love everything about this house. And I'm sure there's some lesson in there where like change is good and maybe you'll find out the even better house. But for me, in at least primary, I'm super happy. I do think in general, the older I'm getting, the more I'm inclined to renting, just things in general. Why is that? Convenience, headache, 
Yeah. Like the more I get older, the more I'm like, can I just pay for this problem to go away? And it is a problem to think about. Like I own rental properties and it's, it is a headache. It's pretty constantly like some, one of my tenants, like my toilet's not working. I'm like, dude, go outside. <laughs> yeah, <I'm> like, <laughs> like, dude, you're a single guy. Like you'll be fine outside. So anyway, they're, they're just constantly. But I think if you want to stay where you are, because the, the landlord controls you, you have no control. The, the only person who controls is the city who can tax you and stuff. But if you, besides that, you, if you want to stay where you are, like your landlord can control that. If you got to uh, take a, say some of the cash flow you pull off of AppSumo and invest mm. it in a side business, mm. would you select a quote, boring business, which is quite trendy nowadays, or a technology enabled, quicker paced business? I like how boring business now are sexy things. Like I want the flashy, <laughs> give me the sexiest thing out there. <laughs> you know, I'll give you an example. I invested in a bar in Austin called Stereotype. And I'll tell you, I'll give you, I would do the thing, and I'll tell you, give me the thing with the better upside and better margins. That's what I'd want. And it also depends on your investment analysis. You don't, about, I think people, they point to these boring businesses because they, they're they safe as part of it. It's not safe. Go on. And so this bar is on 6th Street in Austin, like the alcoholics like hangout. Yeah. This bar was the number one bar. It used to be Kung Fu Saloon. And then these guys bought it, bought the, or rented the space. And then uh, they're like, hey, do you want to invest? And I got some money from something. And I gave them 25000 And I didn't know how far, one, I don't know shit about bars. <laughs> right? Just because you drink doesn't mean you're a good bar. <laughs> it went out of business a year later. And then you can take that 25000 put in the S&P 500, get 7% on an annualized average return, doubles every seven years. Like, that's pretty good. Right? So the upside of, or buying Amazon stock. Like, the upside of Amazon stock is 100 It could have been 10000 but a bar's upside, like what's your optimal return? Like 7% cash on cash return a year, maybe? 8%? So, and the the downside though is it can go to zero. Mm. Like Amazon probably won't go to zero. So coming back on it, I think there's two ways I would consider it. One, what's your asset allocation? I'm very conservative as an investor because I can't control it. So most of my money's in like the S&P 500. Some of it's in real estate. And a lot of it's in cash. Another popular strategy, you know, I love, everybody knows like the Craigslist expansion contraction diagram where look at all the startups that came mm. from these Craigslist categories. And a lot of internet commentators will say like, there's always times of like consolidation and then specialization. Right now it seems to be popular, at least on Twitter, to buy or to invest in an ecosystem of brands like around a core brand. So why aren't you taking AppSumo Cash, which is an extremely healthy company, and building out like an app sumo ecosystem where your customers flow through to all different types of marketplaces, products, and why not take that strategy up? Isn't it tempting? Taking a step back here, I think there's ways of making money and there's ways of protecting your money. And so I think you have to separate two. It's like, what's your active investments and what's your more passive investments? And I think people kind of confuse those. Like, I'm going to be a, an active, passive real estate investor. It's like, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> Why not? Because if you actually want to make money in real estate, you have to be active. Like this miracle, like I invested in PeerStreet.com and it was like, oh, you can just magically invest in real estate and you'll get money and they went bankrupt. And my point is, is not, none of it's really guaranteed, I guess is the bigger thing. And so I want to control as much as I can around my finances because I don't want to risk it. So your question originally was more... No, keep going with that. I mean, maybe even so the in fact terms that your dad lost your money, what did you learn from that lesson? You want to have like enough buffer so that the, if anything ever happens, you're you're protected. Yeah. So you're protected. And that's also how I've hired people. Like hire people who like have wives, hire people who have kids. Like they're not going to go nomading right away. <laughs> they're not. They're going to be at home. Yeah. They're going to probably not. And, you know, I think as I've gotten in my 40s, I'm much more like that too. So in terms of the investing in finances, I think there's now... A, we were talking about the ecosystem yeah, around us. I, I think on Twitter, you see these people who like build a brand and then they're like, all right, I've got 18 different businesses. And it's like, all right, which of them are actually doing well, right? And maybe one. And so I think with AppSumo over 15, it's almost 15 years we've been doing this stuff. Like really just AppSumo is the only thing doing well. <laughs> so one, what I'm trying to tell you is I got lucky once and I'm just riding it. But I think the other part of that is instead of trying to do a new thing, how do you make the thing you currently have better? Specifically, let's take AppSumo. So, you know, there's a Twitter approach where it's like, hey, I've got like this consulting business. I've got this courts business. I've got this like, I invested in these three companies that are related. I'm trying to say if AppSumo is working, how do I get more people into AppSumo and increase that, the actual core of the ecosystem? 
So how do right now in terms of strategically for next year, we're trying to think, what can we do to make more awareness and more top of funnel people be aware of AppSumo? And then as we get more partners in our ecosystem, how do we support these partners after they launch an AppSumo? And I think what most people are doing and I've historically done is like, oh, let's do like stuff over here on the side. And hopefully that'll be better. It's like, no, why don't you just keep making the thing that has more opportunity even better? End of the business questions. I wanted to ask you at the end here, I actually opened up an episode a few weeks back about, I've noticed a lot of people getting injured because we're guys that like, entrepreneurs often like sports and competitive sports. And then we keep doing them until we're 40. But you've taken up cycling. I'm curious what cycling means to you. If you could just say a few words on why you ride and why you're involved in the sport. So I'm 41 and I got injured doing a push-up. <laughs> 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 and so what was interesting was because I'm not doing push because I injured my arm doing push-ups, I'm not doing squash, not doing boxing. I'm not doing really like kind of like crossfitty home high intensity workouts. And so kind of one of these these like cliche things like because that problem happened, an opportunity arose where I have more time to go cycling because my legs are fine, but my arms are hurting. And it's been interesting. I've cycled for 10 years and only in the past month have I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> I know it sounds crazy. I know it sounds a little crazy, but it's more finally getting to a point where I'm skilled enough, quote unquote skilled enough, where I can do rides that. I normally couldn't do and I can do them in a pace that feels like, wow, there's something happening here. I think of freedom when I cycle. The question always comes to my head. I think about this every time. What are you thinking about when you're cycling? And that's what I think about when I'm cycling. And I'll just share. When I'm going up a hill and it's really hard and that's what I, that's my favorite part. When it's really hard. And I always think to myself, no, you're so strong. <laughs> that's what I think. I think. And I, I'm just like, I guess it's a moment where I'm proud of myself. You know, we talked about promoting and validation externally. I guess it, that's the moment of internal validation where I'm just like, dude, you can do hard things. And I get to the top of the hill and, you know, you're already there because you're faster or, you, you know, maybe I'm waiting for you because you're, you've been generous to me. And uh, it's a sense of freedom of exploring the world and feeling good about myself. And lately when I'm on the bike, it's just like, and I treated myself finally after, when I could have 40 years ago, but I finally started treating myself to a nice bike, probably 10 years. And it's like, wow. It's like a, a wow feeling. A lot of that. It's all, it's all that. It's cool. Noah Kagan, thanks for joining us on the podcast. Shout out, Dan. Thanks for having me. Big shout out to Noah Kagan for dropping by the podcast. Just a quick little news segment at the end. Just got off of two days of you know meals and orientation with our new events coordinator. I know I flogged that job opening a lot on the podcast. Appreciate you guys putting it out there. We had such a blast in person. I'm wondering, do you guys do that? Do you guys have in-person orientations for new team members? Definitely thinking right now that that was totally worth our time and energy to get together and to go over all the big plans we have together. I thought that I'd just mention that update. Of course, DCBKK, our biggest event of the year, is coming up in less than two months. So we've been working pretty hard on that. Also, we just have a ton of events coming down the pike. So... Um, I really realized that when we got the old whiteboard out and all of a sudden, pop, 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 just events everywhere, including over 30 every single month that are member organized. So a lot of exciting stuff coming down the pike in large part, thanks to your contributions and ideas that you send into us. We appreciate it. We'll be back as always next Thursday morning. That's it for this week. Thanks for listening. Hey, thanks for listening to the Tropical MBA podcast. You can go to tropicalmba.com, get access to hundreds of back episodes and all kinds of other goodies. Load up your iPod. That is the cheapest way to fly business class on your next international flight. We will see you next Thursday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time.